trying to get back so I couldn't get online so I just praise God for you praise God I hope that you had a, a better week you know than I did you know and um, no matter what's going on like I always say we just praise his name all the way through hallelujah so um, I know um, school started now and um, thanks is a little a little upside down, you know, things it's shifting in your household, work, school, and with this pandemic going on, and, you know, um, there is a lot of school that's, you know, sending kids home, they quarantine them. Oh, it's a mess, it's a mess, it's a mess. Look, I get weary just talking about it. But, you know, but we know God is good. God is good. So we're not going to focus on what's going on, but we are going to keep our eyes upon him because he is in control. Hallelujah. Having said that, we are going to continue on from, from where we left up last, last, the last time we were, we were online. We were talking about what does it mean to do the will of God. So we're going to um, continue with that topic. And uh, we'll see where the Lord leads. Hallelujah. So we're going to invite him before we begin. Hallelujah. Father God, we just bless you this morning. We thank you. We glorify you. We welcome you, Father. We welcome you in this place. We welcome you. In our heart, we invite you to have your way. Your will be done this morning as it is in heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you will open the heart of your people. Plow their heart this morning and let everything you are about to release through my spirit to them, Lord God, fall into good ground. Give them ear to hear, Father God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you will breathe upon them and open their understanding. Father, let every word that come out of my mouth is your word. Let, Father God, I ask that you, uh, you release a word in due season this morning. A word, Father God, that will break chains. A word, Father God, that will open prison doors. A word, Father God that will set the captive free, that will break bondages. A word, Father God, that will pump up their faith. A word, Father God, that will give them hope. We thank you for that, Father God. We take authority right now over all unclean spirit, every demonic distractions, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now sit it in the heavenly place with you, Father, and I ask that your will be done. 
in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Last week, <clears throat> we talk about, we talk about, we were talking about what it means to do the will of God. And we, we cover, let me do a small recap, okay? We cover what was the will of God is all about. We learned that uh, the will of God is, uh, it is a strong desire of God's heart for us, not just his intention. He's, he has a strong desire in his heart for us. And this is where uh, um, we, we, talk, we didn't talk about God's strong desire. He talked about it in Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, only I know the plan that I have for your life. So therefore, that is um, his desire, his perfect will for your life. We talk about that. We also talk about God's perfect will. is his decrees. So that's Matthew 16 that we prayed. Uh, uh, well, some people prayed. Um, we talk about that all the time. You know, the, it's, it was the... the um, the, the model prayer that uh, God, uh, Jesus himself gave us when he said on Matthew 16, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So therefore, um, God's will is his decrees. We talk about that God has only one will, just one, and that is his perfect will. We talk about doing the perfect will of God is to do exactly what he asks of you. No buts, no compromise, no opinion, no nothing. Just hear and obey. Just hear and obey. That's doing the will of God. We talk about all that last week. You can um, um, look for that title and um, watch it to see um, what we're going to be talking about today and, and, and it's going to link in. Hallelujah. So um, we left off with um, we talk about uh, on Luke uh, 22 verse 42 when Jesus um, was in the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed as his father that you know what I don't think I want to go through this but it's not my will but your will be done so we learned um, we, we did cover the fact that Jesus was the perfect example of what it's like to do God's perfect will and I did mention something I said Jesus is the perfect will of God in action. So now let's continue on with, with that, okay? Jesus is our perfect example. It's the one that we should imitate. It's the one that we should look up to the way he did things when he was here on earth um, as a human, as a human. We know that he was also God, 100% God, 100% man. But when he was down here, he functioned as a man. He functioned as a man, not as God. He functioned as a man. And, and um, so that's why he is the perfect example that we can follow in what it's like. What doing the perfect will of God looks like. And we know Jesus doing the perfect will of God. We know where it ends. We know where it ends. So that means doing the perfect will of God. We, we tend to have this mindset. Doing God's will is supposed to be no problem, no trouble. No. So if we follow in Jesus Jesus' example, we know where that leads him. If we follow Jesus' example, we know he dealt with all kind of stuff, all kind of stuff. It wasn't just when he was going uh, toward the cross, when he went through all the things he went through at once, you know, the beating, the speeding, the this, the that. No, it was throughout his life, he went through stuff. This is why Jesus is 
I mean, he, he knew everything, everything that we go through. He can relate. He can relate. That's why he came in a man form living as a man, except that he didn't have no sin. That was the only thing that Jesus didn't have in common with us until the cross, because it was until then that's when he he carried our sin. Therefore, he knew he knew what sin when you sin what it's like. He knew that. So therefore, Jesus can relate to us in many 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 level, many things. There is absolutely nothing you are going through now that Jesus didn't go through it. And remember that in the Bible, they don't sit there and tell you everything about him. They don't talk about his childhood except when he was 12 and he, went, he was in the temple. You know, they mentioned when he was 12. After they mentioned that like he was born and then of course Satan tried to kill him. We know that he spent a decade in Egypt and in a foreign country. Yes, Jesus was an immigrant somewhere else. So there is absolutely nothing that you're going through that Jesus didn't go through. So that's why Jesus is the perfect example. That's why he left his glory, he left his power, he left everything, and he came down here and lived like us, except he didn't have no sin. If he was born just like you and I, he wouldn't have sinned, so therefore he would not be able to save us. That's why he, God sent him, the Father sent him the way he did. Hallelujah. So having said that, so this is why he is the perfect example. So we're going to talk about, uh, um, you know, about four, little, four things that, you know, um, that kind of um, jump at me. And, and um, Jesus doing God's will, perfect will in action. Okay, so now let's look at uh, John 5, verses 30. John 5, verses 30. It says, I'm going to read this in God, uh, G-N-T, God News Translation. I can do nothing on my own authority. I judge only as God tells me. So my judgment is right because I am not trying to do what I want, but only what he who sent me wants. So Jesus didn't do what he wants, although he himself is God. He chose to submit himself to the Father. And we knew that Jesus, of course, was filled with the Holy Spirit. We learn about that when he got baptized in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And this is the same spirit that lives in us today. So those who don't believe in the Holy Spirit, that's very sad because without the Holy Spirit, you can't do the things that we need to do. The things that you saw Jesus did. We read Jesus. We didn't see, you know, people trying to put, you know, do they do pretty, uh, pretty much good job putting a movie together according to the gospel. You see what I'm saying? But we read about the things that Jesus did. And he did all of that through the power of the Holy Spirit. So you tell me when you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, how are you going to keep up? How are you going to do the things that, oh, you want Jesus to do through you? You need the Holy Spirit for that because he's the one who's going to give you the power to do it. He's going to give you the power to be bold enough to do the things that Jesus tell you to do. So if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, you need prayer. Send me an email. I'll pray. I'll keep you in prayer because you are clearly in error. Hallelujah. So I don't know for who that was. I pray that you receive it. So we praise God. So the Holy Spirit came upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells you, I do nothing on my own authority. In other words, 
I have the right, but I'm, I don't do it. I don't choose to use my right, but I go by what my father tells me to do. It's not like today we are, oh, I have the right not to wear masks. I have the right not to dress. I have to drive or to die. You see what I'm saying? No, it wasn't him. That wasn't, that wasn't Jesus. So if we're going to follow him so we know that he has the authority, he is God. But yet he chose to submit himself under the Father's authority. And he does everything his Father tells him to do. There's not a thing you read about Jesus doing in the Word that his Father didn't tell him or didn't show him. That's why he said, I do nothing in my own authority. I judge only as God my Father tells me. And when I judge, it's right. Because I'm doing what my father tells me. So now if we're going to follow Jesus' example, so we have to do like he did. Submit to him. And give him your rights. Your rights. Because when you're Jesus' follower, really and truly, you have no rights. You choose that. You choose not to have no right. Because if you hold on to your right, there is nothing he can do with you. Because he said, if you're going to come after me, you must deny who you are. <laughs> you must deny yourself. That means you have right, so now you're going to deny what you want in order to do what Jesus wants. That's what that means. So if you want to be Christ's follower, i got to say follower because there is a huge difference between Christian and Christ follower. Everybody's a Christian today. But there is a very few that are Christ followers. That's what Jesus said. And the wide road, there is a lot of Christians. But in the road that is so narrow, you can't barely squeeze through. Because if you're too fat of yourself, you cannot go through that road. Because it's restricted, it's very restricted, and it's narrow. So therefore, you cannot be fat of yourself. That means Jesus got to, oh, you got to go on a diet. That means you got to get skinny in order to go through Jesus' road. So that's why I'm using Christ follower. Because Christ follower are skinny in the spirit. Because they got this strict road. You get stricter and stricter. You see what I'm saying? It depends where Jesus is going with you. It depends what your assignment is. Oh, you got to do some workout. You got to lose some weight to, 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 to squeeze through that road he's talking about. But Christians, what I see out there, people saying, I'm a Christian. They're strolling through. They're dancing. They're doing the boogie boogie. They're doing the whatever they're doing. They're walking down the roads. No trouble. No, nothing. Oh, look at me. I'm self-righteous. And then they're walking right to hell. So there is a difference between following, be a follower of Christ. Because when you are a follower of Christ, guess what? You take your right, you give it to God. And you say, God, he's my right, and I want to do what you tell me to do. That's what it means to do the will of God. Not everybody can handle that. That's why Jesus said, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, so that means it's a choice to be Christ's follower. So let's look at, let's look at how we can view the will of God important it was as for Jesus. 
Let's look at why the will of God was so important for Jesus. I mean, why, why, why was it that important for him to do what his father tells him to do? So let, let, let's kind of explore a couple of things he dropped, in, uh, he dropped in my spirit. So we read last week in John 4.34 that he said, my, uh, my food is to do the will of God. So, doing the will of God, doing the perfect will of God for Jesus, it was more important than physical food. That was the kind of food he eats. He said, it is so important to me that that's what I eat for food. And then it's so important that I finished it. That was doing, that's how important it was for him. So Matthew, John 4, 32, 34, in the New King James Version, but he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, not only that, but to finish it. So a lot of times God will ask us to do something really and truly, we start it, we don't finish it. So it was important for, the, for Jesus not only to do what his father sent him to do, but it was very important that he finish it. So if God asked us to do something, we can just start it and then that's it. Because it's an assignment. We have to complete the assignment. You know, we're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of we start doing things and then all of a sudden we're not into it anymore. Or something happened, we don't do it anymore. Or we, we, we get, I don't know, things happen. Life just happened. And then you know what happened? When God gives you that assignment, whatever it is that you had to do, you started to do it, you hear, you obey, you do it. And then when, when you stop obeying him, meaning you stop doing whatever, it stop, the assignment stops at that point. It stays right there until you come back to it. It stays right there because it's that important to not only do the will of God, but it's so important to finish it as well, as well. So that was very important to Jesus. Doing the will of God was so important that he make it his food. He make it his food to do the will of his father, to do what his father tells him to do, where to go, what to do, what to eat, whom to have dinner with, because we know, we read in the word that, you know, those, you know, pretending, you know, always, always trying to, you know, invite Jesus to dinner, not because they want anything, just looking for things to, 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 you know, accuse him and stuff like that. We know that. So we know Every move, everything that Jesus had to do, his father showed him, his father told him. So that means to me, in order to know all these things, you got to spend time with the father. So we also read throughout the, 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 the life of Jesus, the gospels, we also read that he was always withdrawing himself to spend time with his father. That's how we know who's going to trick him. That's how we know who's going to invite him to dinner. What they're going to discuss. And he's what you're going to say. He's what you're going to do. That's why he knew all those things. And if we want to follow that kind of example. Doing the perfect will of God. That's how we have to do. We have to make it doing the will of God. So important to us that it becomes our food. Hallelujah. The next thing that jumped in my, he dropped in my speech was, it was so important for the Lord to do, to do his father's will, he makes it his family. On Matthew 12, 48 to 50, 
Matthew 12, 48 to 50, and the New Living Translation, it says, Jesus asks, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and sister and mother. Doing the will of God was so important to Jesus, he makes it his family. It was more important for him to do that. We have in the book of John, right? Jesus' first miracle at the wedding, when he turned water into wine, he got into the wedding, enjoying himself. His mother come running to him, son, they have no wine. And Jesus said, what's that got to do with me, woman? My hour has not come. Therefore, I know his father already let him know, look, you're going to do your first miracle. You're going to turn water into wine. But you're going to do it at this time. That's why it's very important to when you're doing the will of God, you have to do it on his time. His time. When God tells you to do something, that's the time. But any time you take your sweet time, you're not doing it. Oh, I'll do it later. Oh, let me think about it. Oh, let me see. Oh, I don't know. Oh, whatever. You sit there trying to write a thesis about it. Guess what? Time is passing by. What time is passing by and God finds somebody else to do it. And because if finds somebody else to do it, when you try to come back and say, oh, now I'm ready, guess what? You're not in God's time. I just learned that myself. You're not in God's time. You are in the time of the enemy. And that's why when you start doing it, things is going wrong. That's why when you start doing whatever it is, it's just not working out because you're not in God's timing. So it's very important when we're doing the will of God, when God says, I need you to do this, it's important that we hear and obey. Because when we don't do it, the time fly by. And then now it's, you're no longer in God's time. So his mother come and tell him, son, we have no, they have no right. Not that Jesus didn't know what he was going to do because his father already revealed it to him. And that, that he does not do anything outside his father's will. So therefore, the time that his mother came and tell him that, it wasn't the time. Maybe he was supposed to do that at 12, 12 noon. And the mother said, oh, they have no wine at 11 a.m. It's not time. It's not time. So it's important to do it at the time that God tells you to do it when he showed you to do it. So it was that important for Jesus. So in that scene right there, he was talking and his brother, somebody said, hey, your mother and your brothers are looking for you outside. Jesus was not about to leave what he's doing Jesus was not about to say, oh, hold on a second, I got to go talk to my brother. It's not, Jesus was not about to say, oh, hello? Oh, okay, you know, I'm in the middle of something right now. I call you back. Okay, okay, mother. All right, what do you want, James? Okay, oh, all right. Yeah, you find that under the pillow. Go ahead. Okay, bye-bye. What I was saying, my brother and sister, you know what, just God loves me. No, it was more important for him. More important for him to do what God tells him to do. His mother can wait. His father can wait. His brothers can wait. His sisters can wait. Because that was the enemy's way of distracting him. So Jesus made that his family doing the will of God. So is everyone 
Whoever is doing the will of God, Jesus said, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are my, my, my everything because you are doing what God tells you to do. That's what it takes to do the will of God. If we are going to follow Jesus' example as Jesus' follower. Look, I'm, let me tell you this. It's not easy at all. I'm not going to stand here and say it's easy. But we also know that God's grace is sufficient. Because when he calls you to do something, when he tells you to do something, when he gives you an assignment, guess what? He also gives you the power. He also equipped you. So he's never going to put more on you than you can handle. You understand? So it's not easy, but that's because it's not, it's not you doing it. It's God doing it in you. It's one thing I just learned because I'm taking a class and this class is just ministering to me. It, we some, Somehow we tend to think that when God asks us to do something, we're the one who's doing it. This is why when God come and said, oh, I need you to go, let's use Haiti. I need you to go to Haiti because I have something for you to do there. From there, we start to give God all kind of excuse, just like Moses. It's, it's our instinct, you know. Hey, we can't help it because we have, you know, the same nature. We start giving God excuses. Oh, well, God, you know what? Do you see what's going on back there? Oh, for God forbid he tells you to go to Afghanistan with what's going on right now. So I just wonder how many, how many of us that God say, okay, I need you to go there now. How many excuses do we start giving God? You know, well, God, do you see what's going on? No, that couldn't possibly be God. Oh, in the name of Jesus, oh, I bind you, Satan. Go away from me. That is not God. Hey, hallelujah, shakarada. Man, we start doing that. You know why? Because we are looking at those countries, what's going on there. And we say, that's not the will of God. God would never ask me to go in a place that things going on right now. So what am I going to do? I don't take it, God. There is no way it's God. And your family member said, no, that's not God. Oh, God would never put you in that situation. God put his own son to the cross. So you tell me. So do you see how we view God? How we think that God does these things and we start giving him excuses after excuses as to why this cannot be done that way, as to why we start doubting him. So if we're going to follow Jesus' way, yes, it's possible. Yes, it's the will of God because doing the will of God never looks somehow good. It doesn't it's not, it doesn't look glamorous. It doesn't, doing the will of God does not look glamorous. It comes with a price. Jesus example. Watch. You, I mean, you, you, you read the Gospels. You see. You know. This one said, it's not glamorous. So when God asks you to do something, it's always going to look hard. It's always going to seem hard. But he said, my grace is sufficient. And then he said, I'm the one who's doing the work through you. So if we can get aligned with the fact that God is the one who's doing the work through me, not me. He's only using my body. So, which is not mine to begin with. You see what I'm saying? So if we can get aligned with that, we, we should be able to do the perfect will of God. Because we have we have this mindset, we we keeping our mind upon him. So that's what Jesus did. He keep his mind upon his father. I lift up my head up to the hill where my help come from, from God. 
So he keep his head up toward God, watching what God's doing, him taking instructions, doing the things he tell him to do. Because he had the same mindset. He knows that, hey, I'm human down here and I need him to help me do this because I'm not using my own power. So when we put in our mind that, hey, I'm the one who's doing this, I'm the one who's doing that. Well, you tell me to go to Haiti. Oh, I don't have the money. Where am I going to get the money? Oh, what? You see what I'm saying? Oh, well, well, ticket is so expensive right now. Oh, uh, well, where, where am I going to stay? Man, do you see this? Oh, this voodoo thing going on over there. Oh, man, God. Oh, oh I mean, we, 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 because we think we don't want to have to do the work. So we start giving God excuses. So imagine Jesus was giving the father excuses. Where would I be today? Where would you be today? You see what I'm saying? So point number three, doing the will of God was so important for, for Jesus. He treated it as his first love. What do I mean by that? Let's read John 14. Verse 15, I'm going to read that in the Amplified Version. It says, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandment. If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandment. So Jesus, because Jesus has such love for his father. That was his way of showing the father, yes, I really, really love you. He treated him as his first love. Let's cross reference that with 1 John 5, verse 3. I'm going to read that in the New International Version. It says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, meaning when God tells you something, he's going to make sure he made a provision for it. He's not going to give you a way to carry that you cannot carry. God never going to ask you to do something or go somewhere, whatever it may be, when he knows that you can handle it. When he knows that you're not in the level to handle it. It's never. And besides, whatever it is that God is going to have you do, guess what? It's going to match your character. So that means he's never going to ask you to do anything beyond what you can do. That's it. So, Jesus treat, it was that important, he treated the will, the will of God as his first love. You know the story on on uh, Revelation, let's read that. Revelation 2, and when Jesus sent the letters to the seven churches in Asia, and he was telling each of those churches, here's what you're doing good, and here's what you're not doing good. Here's what you're doing okay, and this is what you lack on. So we know the first church he sent a letter to, he told them that was the church at Ephesus on John, uh, sorry, Revelation 2, starting verse 2, 2 to 6. It says, I'm going to read that in a, a Good News translation. It says, I know what you have done. I know how hard you have worked and how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. They are doing all the good stuff. Good stuff. It says, you are patient, so we know they're bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You have suffered for my sake and you have not given up. He says, but this is what I have against you. You 
do not love me now as you did at first. Think how far you have fallen. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place, the Holy Spirit. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. What I wanted to focus on, he says, but I have one thing against you. You do not love me the way you did at first. The new King Gentile said, you have left your first love. What does that mean? You know, when we in love, you, 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 you like you just want to always please that person. This is to our capacity here on earth, like when we think we're in love with somebody. So we cannot compare this love with God because we, when we're in love with somebody, guess what? That's until that person hurt you. Because when they hurt you, when they hurt you, you no longer in love, period, period. You no longer in love because they hurt you. They broke your heart, you no longer in love, right? So now this is not that love we're talking about. Jesus is talking about this. When we first get acquainted with Jesus, we invite him into our life. If you really do that with all your heart, you can relate with what I'm saying right now. Man, you want to do stuff. Man, you want to give Jesus everything. Oh my God, it's just, I can't describe it. Because it's like, I'll give you my life. You're willing to do anything. You're willing to lay your life down because you're in love with the Lord. Man, you want to please him. You're trying to live a life to please God. God, you try your very best and then he empower you because guess what? It's all about him. You know, like if you have a friend and you grew up together, let's say to, you know, girls or boys, whatever. So usually you find that in girls. It's in the boys too. You, you, you were raised, you, this is your friend from childhood. You all grew up together and then all of a sudden, you know what will separate them? If you're a girl, a boy will. If you're a boy, a girl will. Because when they start getting involved with a boy, with a girl, the relationship between you and them is not the same anymore. Why? Because they don't spend much much time with you anymore. Because they just found somebody they love now. They're giving that person everything they got. That's why sometimes there is jealousy going on. Because they could no longer spend as much time with you. Now you just, hey, how you doing? Hey, oh, but, oh, where am I going now? Now it's, how you doing? And then they don't even do it with, how are you doing? It's just, are you? And then they put the D and then question mark. You see what I'm saying? So everything is kind of like shorthand right now. Hey, uh, well, yeah. oh, talk to you later. You know, I'm meeting so and so. Hey, I, do, do you want to go to a basketball game? Oh, you know what? I can't. I'm taking my girl to dinner. That's not how it was. So now you don't have the same relationship anymore because now you're giving that new person, that person now who has a part of your heart, the whole attention. You do with everything with them. You just want to be with them all the time. This is how it is when we really in love with the Lord. We want to give him everything, all our time. This is why it was never nothing for you to spend all day reading the, the word. It was never nothing for you to spend all day praying. You spend it three, four hours in prayer. You don't even realize three, four hours have gone by because you enjoy spending time with him. So that 
church apparently wasn't doing that. They were more into works. This is why Jesus said, I've seen your works. I applaud you, but you don't love me anymore the way you used to. So in our walk with the Lord, guess what happened? We tend to walk away. Because our heart, sometimes we to consume with works. Meaning, oh, feeding the pool, going to mission field, doing this, building church. It's all works. And then, while we're doing that, we're doing it for the Lord's too. But it's a good thing. We're feeding the pool. We, we're in the mission field. We're doing all these things. I mean, oh, it's good. Notice what Jesus said. I have one thing against you. And if you don't turn away and come back to me, hey, I'm going to remove the Holy Spirit away from you. The light that you have going on, it's going to become dim and dim until it goes out. That's how important it is for the Lord. Because he said, if you love me, if you love me, you will obey you will do what I ask of you, just like you used to do when we first met. So that's how important it is to do the will of God if we're going to follow Jesus' footsteps. That was, like I said, he was God's perfect will in action. He came to demonstrate to us how we suppose to be when we do in God's will, the Father, when he asks us to do something. When he asks us to do something. Hallelujah. So we praise God for that. So now we need to ask the Lord, am I, am I, am I in your will? Am I in your perfect will? What is it that you ask me to do, Lord? What is it that you ask me to do and I have not done it? Am I in your will? You need to ask the Lord for that. Start asking the Lord, check my heart. Because a lot of time we can get consumed with works. We're doing all the good stuff, but yet your heart is far away from the Lord. But yet it doesn't have your attention anymore because everything else takes first place. But you're still doing the things. Yeah, you still have church. You still play the worship. So you're just there. But your heart, the way you used to be, it's like, ooh, you get old. And then, oh, I'm too old for that. It's like us here in a relationship, as you get older in a relationship, there are a lot of things you just don't do anymore, but God don't want it that way. God wants to be treated the same way we used to feel, you know, when we first acquainted with him. Hallelujah. And one thing Jesus, that was very important to Jesus, that's the last one, that was very important to him. Doing God's will, he was never looking to honor himself. John 5, 41, in the Good News translation, he says, I am not looking for human praise. It was so important to him that whatever everybody else think didn't matter to him. That's, it was that important to do the will of God. Because you know what, really and truly, when you really want to do the will of God, when God calls you and get his hand upon you, and you all about what doing what he says to do, really and truly, you don't have friends. No, you're not. Because doing God's will never going to align with what they want, with what they see, with their own naked eyes. But if they are aligned with you and have the same mindset with you, oh yeah, you have that friend. But if they don't, 
It's not, it's not easy, so you probably not going to have friends to begin with. That's a price to pay. That's a price to pay. So on verse 44 in that same chapter, chapter John chapter 5, he said, how could you believe in me when you seek, when you seek and receive glory and approval from one another? And yet you do not seek the glory and approval which comes from the one and only God. That's from the Amplified Vision. When you are looking to please people, you cannot please God. When you are looking to go where they tell you to go, you cannot please God because you ain't got room for God to tell you what to do. You can't please Him. So when you when you when it's important to you to get approval of what your husband, wife, mother, father, brother, sister, cousins, auntie, the whole line, guess what? You can't do the will of God. Because those are the things that's important to you. When you care about what people say, you can't do the will of God. That's why Jesus said, I'm not looking for anybody's approval. I'm not looking for anybody's praise. I'm just one of I want the approval of my father. So if we're going to follow Jesus' example, we want the approval of God, not everybody else. Because that means I really and truly they're never going to agree with you. Period. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, speaking from experience, they're not going to agree with you because what you, what God wants you to do doesn't match with what they would like you to do. Because now you don't get approval. Now you decided whether I have your approval or not, I'm going to follow what God said. Now there is problem. Okay? The enemy going to rise up and use that very friend, that very person to persecute you. So, doing the will of God is not easy, my brother and sister. And I'm not going to sit there and tell you that it is easy. We're going to stop right there. It's not easy to do the will of God. It was never easy for the Lord, but he makes it the center of his life. He makes it his food, his family. He makes it his everything. His first love is everything. That's how important it was for him. So we need to make it that important to us. Like we live and breathe just to do what God asks us to do. And it's not going to be easy. It's not an easy walk on the park. But God said, hey, my, my, my grace is sufficient. If you, when we, when we read, read the Gospels, right? When Jesus had to go to the cross, when the time arrived, when it was time for him to go through those things he went through, it was not, it, 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 those people didn't just go ahead and do whatever. It was time because he was in his father's will. That's why when they came to get him, Peter felt like he got a fight for him. Peter felt like, her, uh -uh, not on my watch. He drew his sword and cut the ear of that soldier. What did you just say? Put your sword away, Peter. What's wrong with you? Don't you think I could call on my father and tell him, send me 12 legion of angels? Put your sword away. Do you know what a legion is? 6,000. 6,000. One legion. And he said, don't you think I can ask my father to send me 12? 6,000. They put your sword away. So therefore, they didn't come to get him because the father didn't allow it. Because it was time. It was time. And Jesus said, nobody took my life away. I lay it down. I lay my life down. Nobody took it. This is why they were always trying to catch him. They were always trying to put their hands on him. Jesus just walked right through them. He just walked right through them. They couldn't touch him. They couldn't do nothing. So the same way, if we follow him, Jesus.
religious example, I tell you what, there is absolutely nothing anybody can do to you unless God allows it. Keep that in mind. Unless he allows it, there is absolutely nothing they can do to you. That's it. That's it. But it's a choice. That's why Jesus gave us the choice. If you want to follow me, you must lay your rights down. If you want to be my disciple, you must lay your life down. You must give me your right. Give me the right to yourself and then watch me exalt you. Watch me do wonders to you. Watch me have you done things I've never done on this earth. Watch me. All you gotta do is give me the right to yourself. And not many of us willing to do that. Not many of us. This is, he says, this is why he says the road is restricted. Very few, very few found it. So that means, like the church in Ephesus, guess what? It's going to be, in, because Jesus applauded them for the works. But if they don't turn away, if they don't turn back to their first love, guess what? Se uh, Matthew 7, 7, 21 going to take place later on. They're going to go like this. And Jesus is going to crack the door open. Who are you? And they're going to say, oh, remember, Lord? We did this, we did this. You even send us a letter applauding us, telling us that we did this, we did that. Let me is going to say, I don't know who you are. Who are you? We don't want that. We do not want that. So this is why it's important to let God glorify us. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know whose heart the Lord is touching. But if God is been asking you, I need you to do something. But yet you, you are torn in between. The doubts, the family member, the friends, the th I mean, everything, everything. I know what it's like. I know it's not easy. But guess what? At the end of the day, you got to make a decision. And the decision is, am I going to follow God? Or am I going to follow and listen whoever is opposing you? Because at the end of the day, when God requires your breath, none of those people can stand for you. It's going to be you and you alone standing before the Almighty and, and, and answer those questions he's going to ask you. Your mama, your papa, your brother, your sister, your cousin, or whoever your family member is, your husband, your wife, they can't answer for you. They can't. So at the end of the day, you're the one who's going to give an account. So now, the decision, you got to make a decision. What do you want? Do you want to enjoy the, 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 the five minutes pleasure here of not doing what God tells you to do? And then, oh, enjoy burning in hell later. That's all I can say. Because if you keep going like this, this is only going to crack the door open for you. Because if this doesn't know you, where are you going? If he says you can't come in, you tell me where you're going because there is only two ways. It's either heaven or hell. There's only two ways. Right? So now, it's hard. It's very hard. But at the end of the day, the decision that you make, I'm telling you, if you choose God, you won't be sorry. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. My God, it's going to be hard. But Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. And keep that in mind. He's never, ever, ever going to ask you to do something that you can't do. In your own eyes, you see you can't do it. In your own eyes, you see it's big. In your own eyes, you see like you like a, those little crickets. Like those, those Israelites who saw the giant. They saw big. They, they, they say, oh, we like little crickets. Unless you see it that way. But that's not how 
it is God's never going to do that to you. He's always going to give you something to do based on where you are. Sometimes God just waiting to see, are you going to obey me? Are you going to choose me? Am I your first love? Am I your first love? Because if I'm your first love, you put everything else on the side and spend the time with me. After that, you, you give attention to the rest. And that comes whether you married or not. That comes whether you have children or not. That comes whether you have family or not, whatever. Jesus must be above all of them. This second. This second. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't be here. So, therefore, when God asks you to do his will, when to follow God's perfect will, it's going to be hard. But Jesus said, guess what? I overcome the world. I've done it. I, 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 I made it the most important thing in my life until it was finished. Until it was finished. Until it was finished. On John 17, 4, it says, I bring glory to you, Father. I finished the work that you gave me to do. So when we do in the will of God, when God asks us to do something, I don't care, it's something small. God's just waiting to see, are you going to obey me? And then when you do that, when you do that, you bring glory to him because you do something, you complete it. So I pray the Lord that, that he ministered to you. And I pray if he's talking to you that you receive it. I pray you let him search your heart and ask him, okay, where did I left you? Where did I left you? You know, because he said, if you love me, if you really love me, you will do what I said. If you really love me, you will obey me. If you really love me, will you stop going to that club I told you stop going to? If you really love me, you stop seeing that boyfriend, that girlfriend I told you to stay away from. If you really love me, you will not marry that person I told you not to marry. If you really love me. That's, and that's the only way we can show Jesus that we loved him. It's hear and obey. So I pray the Lord minister to you. For those of you who do not know the Lord, you have no idea what I'm talking about because right now you are your own. You do whatever you want. Hey, you, you, you don't own anybody anything. You see what I'm saying? But to, to, to know what I'm talking about, to experience that dishes, you need to surrender to him. That's the only way. Because he wants to help you. He wants to change your life. He wants to make you whole. But he cannot do that if you don't submit. He cannot do that. This is why he's always going to give you an invitation. Do you want me to come in your house? I can sit and have dinner with you. I can have communion. I can tell you about me. I can show you who I am. But if you... Don't respond to that invitation when you knock in your door, the door of your heart. When you don't answer, when you tell him, I don't want, I don't want you to come in, when you don't answer, he can't do that. So if you want Jesus to change your life, if you want to follow his example, I know you hear I say doing the will of God is hard. I understand you hear that. But I tell you that, I'll tell you why. It's worth it. It's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it a thousand times, it's worth it. When I say hard, of course you're not going to go to the cross like Jesus did. But it is an example to see that, hey, it's not going to be a walk in the park. That's why that means it's hard. Because you, you're going to come to a point where you got to make decisions. And in your decision, you got to somehow choose God. And sometimes you gotta choose God over a family member. That's why I say it's hard. Okay? But I tell you what, when you're in love with him, it is very easy to do. Easy to do. Yeah, they're gonna get mad, they're gonna get this and that and that. Well, who cares? Guess what? They don't hold your, your life in their hand because you don't wanna have to give an account. 
Because sometimes Jesus himself is testing us. Are you going? He's waiting to see what you're going to do. Okay? So now, if you want him to come in and change your life, say, Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice that you made for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for erasing all my sin. Jesus, I repent of everything I've ever done. Please wash me and cleanse me. Make me hold. Make me a new person. Come and change my life. I invite you into my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Take over. I surrender my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit into your hand. I surrender my home. I surrender my family to you. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name. If you just pray that, guess what? You are now born again. Meaning, you are now a child of God. Guess what's going on right now? The angels are rejoicing only because you just made the right decision. Praise God for you. So stay tuned and um, keep following what um, I'm talking about. I don't know how many parts it's going to be because the Lord just, you know, I'm just going along with um, where he's leading me. I have no idea where he's leading me. I'm just follow alone. So whatever you release in my spirit, so I'll come and share it with you regarding doing his will. Hallelujah. I praise God for you. I hope, I hope, I hope that um, um, you learned something today and I pray that you, 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 you go and get with the Lord and find out where did you first left him and come back to your first love. Hallelujah. So in the meantime, stay safe and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.